This is uh, welcome to our, our fourth lecture of the season. Uh, Lynn Parker, our program director, will speak momentarily and tell you a little bit about the rest of the season. But I just wanted to uh, say a couple of things. First of all, I wish you all a happy new year and a good, good year. And uh, secondly, I want to remind you that uh, it's time to renew your membership uh, in the first of the year. Uh, start a new membership. I, I hope that there's some new members here tonight. I think there are. Uh, okay, we have an interesting uh, topic tonight. Yeah. Uncertain times in China. Uh, and I think it's a very timely topic given what's happening with U.S. China relations right now. Uh, and rather than me uh, introducing the speaker, I have our program director who organizes all this stuff. So Efficiently and well, then the party can. Then you want to open it to our speaker? We'll have a traditional QA after our speaker gives his comments and the reception afterwards for members. Thank you. Okay, so Happy New Year, everybody. Happy I wish you all the best for 2023. It's great to see so many of you out here. As you no doubt have noticed, SWAT continues to grow. Unfortunately, the seats in this auditorium are not growing as well. They stubbornly remain at 256 each month. So, please RSVP for our next event on February 7th to ensure that you have a seat. Dues will remain in spite of increasing inflation at $100 a year or $125 a couple. And if you are not a member yet, but you've been enjoying our lectures and are interested in becoming one, please check in with one of our board members after tonight's presentation about your intention to join and we will be delighted to invite you to tonight's reception as a welcome. Um, are any of our board members, could you raise your hand so people that are members that want to, there's one there. The rest of them, I guess, are out in the reception. Uh, uh, on February 7th, SWAG will host former ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich, along with Russian specialist Dr. Angela Stent, in a double feature update on the war in Ukraine. <laughs> Uh, on April 18th, we will welcome from the United States Institute of Peace, Director for Israel-Palestine, Lucy Kurtzer Elmogen. We are also going to offer you a couple of surprise bonus programs this season, which will be revealed later, so you have to keep checking our website <laughs> for that. Uh, now that I have talked about future events, I would like to have a minute to update you on a past event. Several of our members who attended SWAC's exceptional presentation last spring that focused on Afghanistan have inquired about the status of Chris Nadone's school project as a result of the Taliban takeover. I contacted her last week and asked her for an update, and she sent me a short letter, and this is what she said. Dear SWAC members, the last year has been tough. We never thought we would see the return of a Taliban-led government. Our school project still must continue to keep our social media sites down in order to, to protect the safety of our students and families in the village. The reason that the school has been able to continue is that from the beginning, the village elders supported it. Its, its members make up the school board actually, and have made their own decisions on how to run the school in partnership with the U.S. site of the project, but without what they perceive as Western influence. The village elders have had 20 years of investment in this project, and so have seen it succeed for the benefit of their own children and wanted to continue. We graduated 12 girls at the end of the last school year. It's not a lot, but they were, they were some of the only high school girls in the entire country to have graduated. 
Fundraising has been tough with our inability to use the social media. We made over a thousand chocolate covered pretzels this fall to raise two thousand dollars and we will continue to seek alternative fundraising. We maintain a tight budget with a hundred percent of donations going to the project. Lynn has my contact information. Anyone is interested in more updates in the future. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, now that I've talked about the future and the past, let's get down to business in real time. China is one of our greatest international concerns, and there's no one more qualified to discuss this than tonight's speaker, Dr. Michael O'Hanlon, Senior Fellow and Director of Research Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution. He specializes in U.S. defense policy. He's written more than 20 books more than 40 if you count the co-authored ones, which is absolutely uh, astounding to me. I, in a lifetime, I cannot imagine this. Uh, the latest book, actually, has, is not quite released yet, but you can get it on Amazon.com. It's available, and it will be out in the stores in a couple of, maybe a couple of weeks. This, his latest book is going to be perfect for all of you history buffs out there. And I know one SWACMAS uh, member and historian, Bob McKay, who's going to love this book. So, um, he will be the first in line, I'm sure. The, the book is entitled, Military History for the Modern Strategist, America's Wars Since 1861. So it sounds fantastic, and I can't wait to read it myself. Uh, Dr. O'Hanlon has also written several hundred op-eds in major domestic and international newspapers and has spoken on television and radio more than 4,000 times. He has a PhD from Princeton and he is an adjunct professor at Columbia, Georgetown, and George Washington University. So please give Michael <laughs> O'Hanlon a warm welcome. Thank you everybody and to the greater Sarasota area for the hospitality. Everybody's extended our family this week. We've been down enjoying your amazing weather and your amazing location. Also thanks to all of you in the audience who I know in many walks of life have done so much for our country and our world and continue to. It's an honor to be here. I have some sense of what this community is comprised of and who you are uh, and it's, it's really a privilege to be speaking before you tonight. I also want to say it's even though there is a college football championship later on, uh, it, it's, it, it's a slightly better situation than this time. I spoke at the Air Force Academy maybe 15 years ago, and I got there. It was the last day of the regular season of football, and the, and the game was at the exact same minute as my talk. <laughs> and I hadn't known that at all, and I wondered why the uh, organizers, who were not as thoughtful as this group, um, had, had not managed to stagger at least the time. And, and I said, no one's going to come to my talk. And they said, oh, don't worry. They'll be there. We're making them come. <laughs> I said, well, great. Now you guarantee that I'm going to get a terrible reception. And, and, and then but they had little teleprompters in this huge Air Force. And I said, can, can we at least do one thing? I said, they're all going to be on their phones, checking the score, watching, streaming. And then the, the professor said, no, don't worry. We're not going to let them take their phones. <laughs> And I said, okay, how about we, on the, can you show the score of the game on the teleprompter so only I can see it? And then I can weave the score updates uh, during my talks so that people will pay attention because they'll at least want to hear the update. And I said, yes, we can do that. So, so I promise to you tonight this to be done, maybe not before opening kickoff, but close enough that you won't miss too much. But, but uh, I know that, again, this group understands and appreciates the importance of the China issue in our country's foreign policy and in the world's future. And so I look forward to your thoughts and comments and questions as well. So let me get my opening out of the way so we can get to that, because uh, we've all got a lot, I think, to share with each other on this topic. And you might have seen I chose a hopefully provocative title for my presentation, Are We Overdoing It on China? And I'll just give you my answer up front. Yes, but by 10 to 20%, not by 100%. 
that that 10 to 20 percent, I think, could be important. The reason I say this, and most of us, I think it's fair to say, as I look around our my age or a little more in this room, so we've seen <laughs> at, least, at least a couple of things in our lifetimes where the United States, as a strategic community, that has a political system, formed a consensus about a national security issue where maybe we arguably slightly overdid it. Maybe we indulged in a little bit of groupthink. Maybe we took a good idea and took it a little too far. And to me, the you know exhibits A and B are the Vietnam War and the Iraq War. Where in both cases, if you're fair and you go back and you learn and appreciate the history, and you know, for me, Vietnam was something I, I was alive for the whole Vietnam War, but I didn't understand it or learn about it until it was over. The Iraq War, I was living and working in Washington throughout the entire effort going back to Operation Desert Storm. So that was sort of, for me, a real-time thing. And I remember the way that we developed a consensus on what to do in both those cases. And there was a logic in both cases. That was almost what was dangerous about it. There was a logic to what we did. But in, in, in both cases, we did something big that I think was wrong. And I'm not here to talk Vietnam or Iraq, although both are in my new book. So, so I will also plug my book, Military History for the Modern Strategist. Thank you. Uh, but but, uh, but uh, in the case of, um, of both of those, for example, with Iraq, it wasn't so much that the idea of what we doing. Saddam was crazy. It was that if we were going to do it, we needed to expect it to be a lot harder than, than we prepared for. And uh, anyway, uh, I won't get into a discussion on Vietnam, but I'm worried that with China, what we're going to do is see a country that is a big challenge and a big problem in a lot of ways. And we're going to push back, as we should and as we are, but we're going to potentially push back a little too hard and a little too far. So let me just do three things with the main part of my presentation and do it quickly. The first part especially, I think I can go pretty fast because we're all paying attention to China's rise. And just to remind folks of what China's doing that we don't much like, we as Americans, you know, whether because we believe in democracy and they don't, whether because we have allies in the Western Pacific that they wish we weren't allied with, we have military forces in the Western Pacific they wish we would come back home, a million reasons. But we, we have a different worldview, and there are a lot of things they're doing we don't like. Second, I would like to quickly summarize the American policies of recent years that I think are well-grounded and well-founded, well-thought-through. But then my third part is where I fear we might be overdoing it a little, and I want this to be a little bit of a clarion call, or at least I want to see how you react to my clarion call, that we have to be attentive to not overdo this, and especially with this kind of group, with your experience and sophistication. I really look forward to your response. But one, one way to look at this, but just to give a little bit of a framing, I have the good fortune these days of being on the Defense Policy Board, which is not a super big deal, but it's pretty fun because every quarter we meet for two days at the Pentagon, we get great security clearances, we meet with Secretary Austin and Deputy Secretary Hicks and Under Secretary Polakal and others, and we get great briefings and we, then we give our own feedback. And one of the other Defense Policy Board members, believe it or not, is Henry Kissinger. He's 99 and a half years old. And, and, and so I went to my first a policy board meeting in December of 2021 because it was all, you know, there, there's some continuity. Kissinger's been on it for 20 some years. Everybody keeps that. Uh, but, but some of the rest of us, we got brought on by this or that administration and uh, may or may not extend beyond that administration. So, Madeline Albright, God bless her, and rest her soul, was our chairwoman. And so we, we, we finished our December 2021 meeting, and my wife asked me at the end of the meeting, how did it go? because we talked a lot about China. And, and I said, um, it went great, except Kissinger and I were the only two doves on China. Everybody else was Uber Hawk. And I was, I was doing a little tiny cheek, because in fact, Kissinger's no dove on China. And I hope I'm not either. And I'm not here to tell you that China's all nice guys, and we should just assume that they have you know, our best intentions at heart. I don't think they do. But, uh, but I, w I was struck. And also, you know, the proceedings are private, so I'm only saying, this because Kissinger himself obviously tells the world what he thinks about China and everything else, and I think his advice is often quite sound on that issue, at least. And you know, I think he's obviously had a lot of role in our development of the relationship with China over half a century. A fascinating aspect 
For those who are concerned about the partisan divide in our country, maybe we should start by observing, well, at least on China, we tend to all agree most of the time. I'm, I'm not sure we're going to keep agreeing. But right, it, it's fascinating if you go back 50 years. If you go back 70 years, we don't agree, right? Because we had a big debate about who lost China during uh, the Truman presidency. And then that continued a bit into the McCarthy period and other things. But since the Nixon-Kissinger opening to China in 71-72, we had basically a 40-year period of consensus, rough consensus, as to how to handle China, which was to try to engage with them, first to split them from the Soviets as a way of prevailing in the Cold War, and then to hopefully induce reform by making them see all the benefits of engaging in this global market economy. And the hope would be that if they did that, then their political system would ultimately liberalize and reform, just as their economic path had also evolved and improved and became the goose that laid the golden egg for them. So, of course, they would see the logic of associating uh, with us in a supportive and largely cooperative way. And that consensus really continued, certainly through George W. Bush. Uh, they were starting to get a little nervous in the Bush administration, but Clinton and Bush brought China into the World Trade Organization, maintained this policy of you know, cooperation. Bob Zelik said we should really ask China to be a more responsible stakeholder because they weren't always respecting intellectual property rights and respecting the environment well enough. Uh, and so there were some gentle scoldings along the way, but for about 40 years, both sides basically agreed with this strategy. Engage with them, give them an incentive to be part of a cooperative global economic and political order, and hopefully they will see the benefit, and hopefully their own political reform will continue, just as they went from Mao to Deng Xiaoping to then, you know, arguably a more consensus-based, still not democratic, but at least somewhat more inclusive, Politburo and, uh, and, and Standing Committee, that hopefully that process would continue. Well, about 10 years ago, we started to realize it wasn't continuing, right? And latter period of Obama, as well as then certainly the Trump presidency, and now even the Biden presidency, we're seeing Americans of both political parties push back. So if Donald Trump and Joe Biden were both here today, and we wanted to find a topic to get them to not throw mud pies at each other, probably the best thing would be to bring up China because they both want to be tough on China. And Biden, of course, didn't really like the way Trump did it. But it turns out, here we are two years into the Biden presidency, and he still left most of the Trump tariffs in place. And a lot of other areas of policymaking have just gradually toughened. Trump wanted to use the so-called Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States to prevent China from putting 5G networks here, from otherwise acquiring the crown jewels of our technology. And he did that effectively. And Biden's basically continued. Anyway, um, so I, I'm already doing part one of the talk, but it's basically the same. What are the conditions that then gave rise to this concern about China? What is China doing on the world stage we don't like? Then let me briefly say the policies that I do think we're correctly implementing, but then also those uh, where I think we have to be careful not to overdo it. So a couple more things, and again, you're following this news probably uh, just as closely as I am. I was struck one one, one more thing about my sort of biographical role in this whole thing, or autobiographical role. About 12 years ago, my, or 11 years ago, Jim Steinberg, who at that time had just left the Obama administration as Hillary Clinton's deputy, so he was Deputy Secretary of State. And he had been my boss at Brookings before that. He then became the Dean of um, the Maxwell School at Syracuse, and now he's the Dean of the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins in Washington. And he, so he's had a lot of academic experience, very smart, very thoughtful guy. And he came to me and he said, Mike, you know, I'm really worried that the U.S. and China are on this collision course. And obviously, as an American, but a former Deputy Secretary of State, I tend to think that, generally speaking, China's causing a lot of the problems. But I would admit, if I take a step back at a philosophical level, that you've got this one country that considers itself the shining city on the hill, that's us. And then this other country that considers itself the middle kingdom. And we both sort of have messianic views of who we are and what our role should be in global affairs. And we Americans, by the way, this is not going to quote another Brookings colleague, Bob Kagan, who also has a book coming out this month. And it's, going to, it's from the period of 1900 to 1940 in US foreign policy. And it's, it's going to be sensational. But Kagan, you know, who's a conservative and worked in the Reagan administration, so he's not some 
um, left-leaning critic of American foreign policy, but he often likes to remind people when Americans will say about ourselves, you know, we, we would prefer to be sort of left alone in North America. We just go out and deal with the rest of the world when we have to. We try to stay out of it for, you know, so long. These world wars brought us in. We realized we better stay engaged uh, so that there wasn't a World War III like there had been World War I and World War II. We're basically peaceful people, basically even isolationist leaning in some ways. And we just sort of want to be left alone, but we realize the world sort of needs us. So we're status quo kind of people. And Kagan says that is nonsense. The United States is not about the status quo, and nor should it. The United States is about spreading democracy and spreading market economy around the world. And we get a little nervous even when countries like Singapore cooperate with us but aren't democratic. We get very nervous when countries like China uh, become big powers on the world stage and are not democratic. So if you take these perspectives, you know, Steinberg said to me, we got to write a book about the U.S.-China relationship and look for ways to take some of the edge off the rivalry because it's just going to get worse. He saw it coming a dozen years ago or more. I think he was completely wrong. And obviously there are a lot of things that China's done that have contributed to that. So just to conclude this first part of my talk, in addition to the fact that they now have the world's second largest military budget by far, and they now have the world's biggest manufacturing base by far, and they are up there in almost any major category of manufacturing you could want to mention, and in some areas like rare earth minerals or certain pharmaceuticals, certain other things, electronic components, they dominate the world market to the point where, as we saw during COVID, we could really be put on the map if they chose to cut off trade with us, sort of the way we cut off trade in many ways with Russia in the last year. And so we've really wound up in this position vis-a-vis -vis China where they have developed the kind of capacity to rival us that Nazi Germany never had, that no other great power we ever really fought, ever really had, once we became a world power, once we decided to really use our muscle on the world stage starting with World War I. China's by far and away the most capable, the closest to us in terms of overall muscle. And of course, by some measures of of gross domestic product, as my friends at the World Bank know, if you if you sort of adjust for purchasing power parity for what it actually costs to live in China, they're already the world's largest economy ahead of us. But even as they've reached that level of success, they've continued not to play by the rules, to steal intellectual property. You know, in our spy agencies, we think that it's perfectly fine to steal state secrets of somebody else if what you're trying to do is to understand their war plans or their foreign policy goals, but you're not really supposed to. Gentlemen and gentle women don't steal each other's economic secrets, because if you do that, then the world economy won't really thrive the way we all want it to. That's the American view. And the Chinese, when we, when we say that to them, they're like, huh? The secret's a secret. If I can steal it, I'm going to do what I can to steal it and use it against you. And, um, and we haven't been able to persuade them that that really shouldn't be their attitude towards economic interaction. So that's been a big problem, and you know, there are various estimates. The um, U.S. Economic and Security Review Commission, an official body that tracks U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, estimates that there are a couple hundred or more billion dollars a year in intellectual property theft by China against us. It's a huge amount. And of course, now American companies are much less happy about doing business in China because while 10, 20 years ago they thought that was the great new mecca, now they realize it's never going to be a level playing field. If you want to come in, you've got to do a joint venture, let the Chinese have most of your best ideas, and once the Chinese have mastered those best ideas, they'll push you to the side and displace you. So uh, I think a lot of American business has soured on China along the way. You also know China has made increasingly threatening noises about taking back Taiwan, and China's always wanted to do that in the Chinese Communist Party era. They've never had the ability. Increasingly now, they may have the ability. And again, it's $250 billion a year military budget, more or less, that they've now got, which is three times the number three power. It's still only one third of ours, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But it's three times anybody else's. And, uh, and they're using that investment pretty well to create capabilities that can make our lives very difficult in the Western Pacific if we want to protect Taiwan. So they're developing anti-space assets that can imperil our satellites, uh, they're developing precision 
they, they have developed precision missiles that can strike our airfields in Japan and elsewhere very effectively, maybe even target our <coughs> aircraft carriers in the Western Pacific while they're moving. So it's no longer clear that we can operate effectively in the Western Pacific in a military sense like we would have in the old days. So that's another thing that's caused us considerable angst. And then, you know, you could sort of almost, if you were trying to be understanding and, uh, you know, trying to be cooperative with the Chinese, you could almost say, okay, I get it, you're a rising power, you're more powerful, you're more economically uh, capable, and so of course you're going to have a bigger military budget, Taiwan's a special thing for you, you see it as sort of the equivalent of us having lost, you know, Hawaii or something, of course you want it back, so we'll have to agree to disagree over that issue, but that would be bad enough, but you could almost understand it, almost forgive it, that of course in the last 10 to 20 years, China's been really flexing its muscles around the Senkaku Islands, which both Japan and China claim, you might say, well, okay, China's claim is just as legitimate as Japan's, except it just shouldn't matter to China, because no one lives on these islands, nothing happens on these islands, and yet China's decided they're going to have to make a big stink out of who should own these. You know, and we, we made sure China got back, Taiwan, well, got, got back its territory after World War II. And so a few little islands didn't wind up in, on the side of the ledger China wanted, from the American point of view, they should just accept that because somebody had to decide who gets what. And we gave them back everything that counts, essentially. And we kicked the Japanese out of Taiwan. And it was only the Chinese Civil War that left Taiwan separated from the mainland. It wasn't our, our fault. So from an American point of view, the fact that Chinese want to make a big stink out of the Senkaku Islands really reveals, or could be interpreted to reveal, an aggressive intent and a malevolent uh, outlook overall. If they take the Senkakus, if they take Taiwan, and then especially the South China Sea, where they've drawn this nine-dash line and essentially claimed not just the islands within, but the waterways around, and basically said that they want to treat the South China Sea even more as sort of Chinese waters than we treat the Gulf of Mexico or the Caribbean. And obviously, we don't like to see Chinese warships going through those bodies of water, and they typically don't. We do sail through the South China Sea, but we don't draw a nine-dash line around the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico and say everybody has to stay out unless they get our permission. So we never ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, but we basically abide by it. The Chinese are increasingly not abiding by it. So this is, as you know, the web of, of sort of the allegations that we hit against China, and there's a lot of reason to be concerned that this could be heading the two countries towards a confrontation. Now, that has led us at, you know, U.S. government level to do a lot of the things I've already briefly alluded to, but just to mention a couple more here, and then I'll get to the place where I think we're overdoing it and try to wrap up quickly. Uh, for example, our defense strategy is focused on China as what we call the pacing challenge. The national security strategy calls China our most consequential strategic competitor. I actually like those phrases. They're a little bit boring, a little bureaucraties but at least we're not calling them an enemy or an adversary. However, when I talk to different politicians running for office, to different people in the Pentagon or strategists, you increasingly hear the terms adversary and rival being used. I'll come back to that. But I think we're correct to say the Chinese military modernization program is a major concern for us. And I believe we still should be willing to uh, make it hard for China to conquer Taiwan. We can talk about that later. Some, some of you may not agree with that. But I think at, at this point, it would be difficult for us to just simply abandon any and all interest in Taiwan's future. Therefore, I think we have to be concerned when China has all this capability only 100 miles away from Taiwan and has modernized all these precision strike systems that make it hard for us to come back and defend Taiwan. So I think our military focus on all that is correct. Also, the way China has stolen intellectual property and now used it to come up to our level or above in various areas of manufacturing and high-tech uh, capability mean that we do need to do things like the CHIPS Act to restore semiconductor production in the United States. We do need to make it harder for China to get state-of-the-art semiconductor manufacturing capability as the United States has done this past fall. I agree with that 100%. I think that we should use the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States to make it harder for China to acquire American high-tech assets. It's one thing if they want to buy, you know, uh, a company that's doing, you know, that's the, sort of the, the McDonald's down the street, but if they want to actually invest in our best stuff, 
I think we do need to be careful, and we need to do some vetting even of Chinese graduate students. I want most of them to come, but I think we have to be aware that some could be coming partly to learn what we're up to in area A, B, or C, and then go home and take that intellectual property with them. As a rule, we get more from them than they steal in the, in the case of graduate students, but even there, I think we have to be careful. So all those policies I agree with. And, um, you know, the Trump tariffs were fairly sort of like hitting with a sledgehammer across the board, 10% across all these goods, 25% across all these goods. That's probably a little unnecessary and simplistic. I think we should be more targeted on high tech, but I still understand the logic of why Trump did that when he felt the Chinese were trying to play games with exchange rates and other things. So I don't support that policy, but I can see the genesis. Anyway, that's sort of the sum total of much of what we're doing now with China that I agree with. And let me now try to finish with a provocation because I want to itemize eight or 10 things we're now doing, some of them small, some of them bigger, where I think we're on the verge of going too far. And it's not that we've caused irreparable harm to the relationship yet, but we could also talk ourselves into a mindset where we overreact to the next Chinese provocation or otherwise poison the waters uh, in ways that I think we need to be careful about. So eight or 10 areas where I think we go too far. One, and you'll, you'll disagree with me on some of this, and that's fine, but I'm just giving you the way I see it, and I look forward to your reactions in the discussion. So I'll just go through these eight or 10, and then open it up for conversation. This is not really core to my area of defense and military study, but since Mike Pompeo in December of 2020, and now with Tony Blinken as Secretary of State ever since, we have been accusing the Chinese of genocide against the Uyghur population of the Xinjiang province. I think it's the wrong word to use. I read about genocide as what Hitler did to the Jews. I was in Congo as a Peace Corps volunteer when the Hutu did that to the Tutsi. Genocide means trying to exterminate a people literally in real time with guns, gas, machetes. It means killing. Now, there are, what the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs is more like culture side than genocide. They're making it harder for them to have kids. Over time, that does decrease the population. That's why State Department lawyers can call it genocide. But, and they're putting them in these terrible re-education camps. It's severe human rights repression and abuse. But to me, it's not genocide. And if you call me a genocide, a perpetrator of genocide, I'm the Chinese government in this story, I don't really know how I can do business with you on anything. You didn't just call me a murderer the way Biden rightfully called Putin a murderer a couple of years ago. Remember that time? You just called me a mass murderer on a scale known in history only in a few occasions in the modern era. So I just think we're unnecessarily inflaming the relationship when we accuse the Chinese of genocide. That's maybe more of a semantic thing, but these things sit badly, I think, in Beijing, and we've got to be careful. Another example of what we do wrong, uh, or where I think we're starting to sort of push it. Uh, my friend Mark Esper, former Secretary of Defense, great guy, but he went to Taiwan this summer, and he came back and he publicly said, I'm not sure I believe in the one China policy anymore, which is basically a way of saying, I think maybe we should support Taiwanese independence. I think that's the one thing that responsible American policymakers can't do on either side of the political line. Because for those of you who have studied this history, the idea of trying to get Taiwan to break off is pretty much guaranteed to be the one thing that causes it war, even if China's not sure they'll win. I went, I went to Taiwan in August, and I've been before, and I'm sure a lot of you have been. It's an amazing place. And they have a really good standard of living. And they're doing great stuff. I feel bad for them. They can't call themselves the Republic of Taiwan and have the rest of the world open embassies and respect that nomenclature. I feel bad for them. But I don't feel that bad. Because they get 95% of what they want. They get a very prosperous economy. They get robust self-determination. They have a superpower helping watch their back and, and protect them. And uh, they have their own military, their own security forces, and they don't have to listen to Beijing on anything. That's a pretty good basket of goods as it is. And I think we're now seeing responsible and smart people like Esper and Pompeo talk about abandoning the one China policy. They're not yet in office, they're not yet Secretaries of State at the moment right now, but they were State and Defense before, they could be again. So this, this is starting to become 
uh, socialized as a, an acceptable way to talk about the future of the China-Taiwan relationship that I think is extremely dangerous. Also, when you look through various kinds of Pentagon documents, and I've already alluded to some of these points, we point out China has the second biggest military budget in the world. We say they have the largest navy in terms of the number of ships. We, we, we observe they're quadrupling their nuclear forces based on what we can see them doing. These are three allegations we make all the time. They're all true based on the best intelligence that I've seen that anybody in the United States is aware of, to my knowledge. However, like I said before, China's military budget is still only one-third of ours. Maybe even more telling, the percent of their gross domestic product they devote to their military is less than 2%, which means if they were in NATO, they would be criticized for inadequate burden sharing. <laughs> and, and, uh, I, don't, I don't want to push that point too far. But, but, um, but we spend about three and a quarter percent of our GDP on our military. And I think that's largely in service of a foreign policy that has produced a stable period of great power relations. I support the U.S. level of defense expenditure, but I still don't think we should be surprised when China, as a rising power, wants to sort of at least get into the same rough ballpark that we are in. And they're still nowhere near where we are. Unfortunately for us, they're using that $250 billion a year pretty well. They're making some pretty smart investments in terms of complicating our potential lives, our potential operations if we come to Taiwan's defense or otherwise try to prevail in a fight in the Western Pacific. So it's a challenge. Like I said before, the Pentagon should be focused on China as the main number one long-term potential concern. But we shouldn't be so convinced that they're either arms racing or belligerent or fundamentally aggressive or that Xi Jinping has decided somehow that conquering parts of the Western Pacific, including Taiwan, is his top priority. I don't think that is his top priority. China specialists that I know, for the most part, don't think that's his top priority. A lot of them do worry about where China's headed, but they also point out China wants to have it all. They want to have a prosperous economy. They want to have domestic cohesion and stability. They don't really want World War III against the United States, something they can't control, and have no way to predict how it would end. So I, I tend to take a step back when I look at their military modernization. This idea that they have the biggest navy in the world, it's true they have more ships than we do, unless you count all the ships out in Sarasota Bay. And I'm being facetious, of course, but there is a larger point, which is, and this, this sounds dumb, but it's true, our ships are twice as big on average. <laughs> so we actually did this, Steinberg and I did this when we wrote our book 10 years ago. At that time, and this should you know, concern us, but at that time we had three times the aggregate tonnage in our Navy that the Chinese do in theirs. Today, we still have two times the aggregate tonnage. So there's good news and bad news. We're still way ahead by this measure. Unfortunately, they're closing the gap. So again, I'm not arguing for complacency. And I do favor stronger American naval modernization. But the idea that we should just fixate on the ship count doesn't make any sense to me at all. In fact, I'm not saying that aggregate tonnage is the number one metric that matters either. Uh, you know, we should look at missile tubes, we should look at capabilities in various scenarios, model out in war game, various kinds of contingencies. Uh, but let me just conclude by saying a couple more things on the nuclear balance. So for the longest time, as many of you know, China maintained a minimal nuclear deterrent of 200 to 300 total nuclear warheads. And this went back to Mao and the Chinese view that these weapons were not really worth that much, and in some ways you have to give the Chinese credit for not going as, as insane as the U.S. and Soviet Union, we built 30,000 each. The Chinese only had 1% of our maximum total from the Cold War. And then, in the last 5 to 10 years, they've apparently decided that they want to have something closer to 1,000 or maybe 1,500 nuclear warheads. By the way, we've come way down, as you know, we're around 5,000, and so are the Russians with no particular sign of that number going down because the U.S.-Russia relationship is so poor, we can't really negotiate another arms control agreement. And nor is anybody sure we really want to while the Chinese are coming up. But our expectations now are the Chinese are headed for somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 warheads. And I'll finish on this point because I know I've taken too long already. But what I, what I would say is, who can blame you? I don't like it as an American strategist, but they watched over the Cold War 
that when we thought we were ahead in the nuclear realm, we would sometimes threaten nuclear escalation. In fact, Kissinger told a story about this at the last Defense Policy Board meeting, what he did in the 73 Mideast crisis, when I think Nixon was too drunk to make the decision. And so Kissinger had to decide to put our nuclear forces on alert in order to signal to the Soviets, don't think about intervening to settle the Israeli Arab war. Uh, the Middle East is still an American domain, and if you don't believe me, watch me put our nuclear forces on alert to discourage you from thinking of even sending in a division of airborne forces. That's what Kissinger did in 73. We also made nuclear threats to defend Taiwan when China thought about attacking it much earlier. And so, for the Chinese, it's a perfectly natural thing. It's, it's not good. As an American, I don't like it, but it's natural. For them to want to at least be in the ballpark where if we start making nuclear threats, they can sort of play the same game, or sort of at least not be so minuscule in their capability by comparison that we get the upper hand immediately. And yet, the way we talk about this is as if the Chinese are proving their malevolent and aggressive intent because they want to come up to have one-third as many nuclear warheads as we do. Anyway, I've made enough of my overall pitch here. I'm just nervous, and I really look forward to your reactions and what you, you know, your take on the U.S.-China relationship. I support most of what we're doing, but I can see us going too far. And based on my experience as a young professional in the Iraq War debate, I'm particularly concerned that once we start to rub ourselves up on a national security issue, we Americans can be pretty tough-minded, even a little bit verging on belligerent, which is probably part of why we've been so successful as a great power. We are willing to fight. We've proven that time and time again. But it can also make us dangerous. And the good side of that is that countries should want to be our ally, not our enemy. And most of them do. But the bad side is that sometimes we can take things too far. And I'm worried that on the path we're currently on to China, we may. So let me stop there. With apologies that I went too far, uh, too long. But uh, before we move on. elder brother and North Korea is the naughty younger brother? Discuss. <laughs> yeah, it's a great point. Um, Rick, you know, the Chinese always say, you know, those, those crazy North Koreans, we don't know how to control them either. And that's probably partly true. I think now, I guess the way I would, there's so much to talk about with North Korea, a concern I have is for the last 20 years, we thought maybe China would help us with the North Korea problem. I don't think China has any interest right now in helping us with the North Korea problem because they see us treating them as an adversary and vice versa. I'm not blaming it all on us. It's, we're in this dynamic now where Beijing and Washington don't think either one is interested in cooperation with the other. One more thing I should have said, it's, it's a deviation from your question, but I'll come back with one more word on North Korea. One more thing, we, we, we complain, as we should, that China defends Putin, rhetorically, over the war in Ukraine. And we should complain. And some of the things Beijing has said have been ridiculous about the causes of that war. However, China has sent zero weapons to Russia. And Putin's been begging for weapons. And the Chinese have said no. Now, I'm not saying this makes China's position on the Ukraine war acceptable. But things could be a lot worse. Why do we want to push China and Russia together? We spent decades trying to divide them, successfully, and that's better for us. Maybe that's no longer realistic completely, but the degree to which they're together matters. And Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin may like each other, may have had 40 times, and may have promised at the, uh, you know, at the Olympics last February a relationship without limits, but guess what, Russia? There are limits so far. China doesn't want to give you weapons, because China's against the world. They'll buy cheap oil, they'll profiteer, and they're, again, they're not being good guys, but on the North Korea issue, I think they, historically, their number one goal with North Korea has been no conflict on their border. 
Their number two goal has probably been, we'd like the United States to leave Korea someday. Uh, and so it would be nice to figure out a way to maneuver the Americans off. Number three goal was that North Korea shouldn't have nuclear weapons. So they're, they had the same, two of the top three priorities were the same as ours. But the, the ranking was different. And we, we wanted probably to stay in Korea. They wanted us eventually to leave. But still, there was enough there to work with that you could conceivably imagine a process whereby, what I always thought we should be trying to do with North Korea. And I thought, that, and the Chinese I know supported this uh, because I've been in discussions with Chinese on North Korea. This basic notion that instead of convincing the North Koreans to give up all their nuclear weapons immediately, which they're not going to do, my judgment, we should try to convince them to stop making more. And the good news about that is you can verify it much more easily because you need big facilities to make highly enriched uranium to enrich it or to produce plutonium and then separate it. So it's easier to verify the dismantlement of production capability than to verifiably eliminate their arsenal. And in exchange for that, allow them to have some degree of economic support for a reform process that perhaps would gradually over time mimic Vietnam's process, where even within a communist system they open up. To me, that was always the strategy you should have been following. The Chinese tended to support that. Half the South Korean governments of the last quarter century have supported that. And some Americans have, but the politics here made it hard to really try that. I thought Trump might actually do that. And I was, I'm a big Trump critic, but I still supported that part of his policy. I thought if he had kept the summitry going, maybe he could have gotten to that kind of a deal. But he apparently didn't have that vision or his advisors talked him out of it, or I don't know what. In any event, the Chinese aren't going to help us anymore out of any favor to us. And if anything, they would prefer to see North Korea still be sort of a dagger in our side. Because right now they want to see us have our strategic position either. So I'm concerned we're sacrificing the ability to cooperate on North Korea as a result of this excessive demonization of China. We have a lot of questions here, so let's, let's start with front row. Thank you, and uh, glad to meet a fellow uh, Return Peaceful volunteer. Uh, Philippines, 85 to 87. Awesome. Um, an area of nexus that should be discussed more in line with the things you've talked about, but we hear very little about. In fact, I would say that the most know nothing or little about what I'm going to mention here has to do with the Belt and Road Initiative and its impact uh, on the items that you've mentioned. Um, so Belt and Road Initiative. Belt and Road Initiative. I'll, I'll come back. I'll explain. Uh, made in China 2025. Uh, those 10 areas are key for, uh, I guess, influencing all the dynamics of war uh, technologically. And then the petrodollar and digital currency alignment with China, what they're doing versus what we're doing under Executive Order 14067, I believe. So those three areas, Belt and Road, uh, maybe time 2025, and then uh, digital currency and how it impacts things. Thank you. Thank you. So, a couple of things. First of all, I have no problem with the Chinese having aspirations for what they want to be able to do with their economy in 2025 or, you know, 2027. Sometimes we take these goals the Chinese put forth and we assign malevolent intent or aggressive intent. But that's the way we talk about our goals too, aspirationally, and that's the way any great power does. You want to be in the you know leading domains of, of of leading edge technology, and so I don't have any problem with their rhetorically espousing those goals. What they shouldn't do is steal our best technology and then you know try to compete unfairly. Now, if it's a national security related technology, they're going to try to steal it just because I mean to understand what we can do. Just like we're going to try to steal theirs, and that's it. that's just good old fashioned espionage competition. Uh, but when they try to do it in the economic realm, that's where we should push back. But I'm not bothered by the fact that Chinese want to be world class in many areas of high technology. So on one of your three. Belt and Road Initiative, very interesting. <clears throat> many of you, most of you will probably know about this, but the Chinese decided they want to spend a trillion dollars at least creating a system of roadways, railways, port uh, networks that would tie together much of Eurasia over to Europe, through the Middle East, and to Africa, and even into Latin America. That would essentially be their way of, to some extent, you know, uh, advancing their own mercantilistic, unequal economic vision, where they would be at the center of all these relationships and be able to coerce other countries. It was not done with the kind of commitment to free trade that we've tried to sustain, you know, at least since 1945. And um, 
The good news about the Belt and Road, however, from our point of view, is that a lot of countries are realizing that the Chinese don't really play fair with it. And so Pakistan's been pushing back and saying, you want, to bring, you want us to do a $50 billion loan to build this big rail network where Chinese companies build it. We don't even get the benefit of the construction or the jobs. And then the, the terms of the loan are unfavorable, and if we default, you get a large fraction of the equity. And so the Chinese have now done this in enough places that people are paying attention. So again, I hope I'm not coming across as too much of a panda hunter tonight, because I think in many places, in many places, what I'm trying to say is we've got the tools to compete really well with them. And it turns out transparency on this issue is becoming a really good tool. On the other hand, last thing I'll say, because again, a lot of questions and comments, I look forward to hearing more. We sometimes demonize them over the Belt and Road. And there are, you know, rightly so, because they do a lot of things wrong with it. I've been seeing heads, heads nod when I went through the critiques that many of us are familiar with. But there are some middle income developing countries that actually want the Chinese capital and need the infrastructure and will accept it on the terms that it's being offered. The Indonesias of the world, to some extent, for example, or, or the Malaysias, or, and, you know, well, the best thing we can do is just try to compete. And just on that point, I'll finish on this. Uh, it was fascinating to me, I recently saw a public opinion survey of a lot of Southeast Asian nations, and it turns out the Japanese are by far the most popular country, way ahead of both us and China. Because the Chinese are there with investment and with loans on good terms, with transparency. We're basically not there enough. And the Chinese are there in the wrong way, with at least in some countries. And so I think we can compete on Belt and Road. And by the way, if the worst thing the Chinese do is make money available to countries that want it, even if the terms of the loans aren't very good and, and you know the companies are primarily Chinese, then yeah, I think we can live with that. Let's just outcompete them. So I think that's the main answer to that. Now, I, I, I've gone on long enough, but I don't know enough about that one to be useful. So I'll, I'll pass. Pick up mm -hmm. later. Here Could you comment on India as a buffer against China? Your military seems to be growing significantly, as well as their economic plans. Yeah, and you know, one of the things we've done, one of the areas of U.S. policy that we've seen develop in the last three or four years is the so-called Quad relationship with the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. It's not an alliance because India doesn't want to be our ally. We probably don't want any kind of a promise to come defend them. But uh, there's increasing cooperation on a number of security areas. I think this is fantastically good news for the United States. Not because India is going to help us fight and defeat China militarily. If I had to put my money on one or the other, all the apologies to Indian friends. The, the, the Chinese, I think, are modernizing more aggressively and probably have a better military and will continue to. But the good news is, if India is just part of a general coalition, that reminds China, every time you get aggressive, these coalitions that begin as loose associations or consortiums, we're going to tighten them up. They're going to look more like alliances. We're going to do more patrols together. We're going to do more military investment together. And some of this has already happened with the U.S.-India relationship, going back to Clinton and Bush. You know, it's for about five presidents in a row, we've been seeing an improvement in the U.S.-India relationship, including in military domains. And the Chinese are seeing all this, too. So it's not as if the Indians can defeat the Chinese or really want to come over and help us defend Taiwan. I don't think that is a realistic aspiration. But increasingly, the Indians are on our side of a lot of the big debates, as long as we keep our expectations within modest realms and build the thing up gradually. Because right now, for example, India and China are both buying Russian oil. Uh, so on that point, they're closer together than we are with either one of them. So we have to be realistic about recognizing India always has this streak of autonomy and independence going back to colonial days and its opposition to British rule and the Cold War and its belief in the non-aligned movement. India is never going to want to be an American like ally or really close partner, but I think they will collaborate with us issue by issue and more and more to the extent the Chinese are a threat. So I think it's, that's another great asset sort of in our in our book. Another question. Uh, first off, thank you very much for your very informative uh, presentation and your, your books. I'm very impressed. However, I do have to say I totally disagree with the fact that uh, we may be doing too much in certain areas. In fact, I think that we're not doing enough. 
And I think it has a lot to do with naiveness on, uh, on the part of our governmental leaders. And I think it started with Nixon and Kissinger. I mean, they dealt with Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong is, more res is responsible for more deaths than Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. And they think that they're going to go and give him economic uh, uh, benefits and he's going to turn around and the people that replace him are going to turn around. They're not going to give up power. People in authoritarian positions are not going to give up that, uh, that power. And then to say that, you know, that it's unfair for the Chinese to engage in economic theft, Everybody's been engaged in economic theft all throughout history. The first factories in America were built with technology that was stolen from England. So, you know, we are incredibly naive, and that's why we're in the precarious existential state that we're in right now, and we're continuing down that naive state. And the last point I want to make, because I know there's other people that, uh, and I've got a question here for you, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that... Um, the one thing I'd like you to address is the trajectory and present trends, because you, you didn't address that. If you look at where China was 30 years ago, and you put a graph on there, where they were in terms of manufacturing, in terms of high technology, uh, uh, and, and so forth, just about any category, 5G, artificial intelligence, you name it. They're in a trajectory where they're at a point where they're surpassing us in a number of areas, and if those trends continue, they will become so powerful, we will become weaker, we won't be able to stop them. And I think that's the biggest threat to war. If they continue to grow in strength and we weaken in relation to them, they're going to flex their muscles. If they think that they can take Taiwan, they will. If they take Taiwan, they're going to be more aggressive. They aren't going to stop there just like Hitler didn't stop with Czechoslovakia or Austria and Poland and so forth. They will never stop. The only way to stop them, I believe, is to, to let them know that we got strength and that they're not going to be able to militarily or economically accomplish their goals. So again, my, my question is on the trajectory. If present trends continue and we don't do enough to abate those trends, they're going to be so powerful, we won't be able to do anything, in my opinion. No, thank you for those comments. And uh, you know, we don't see the whole thing eye to eye as, as you deduced and pointed out. But I, I do share your concern about the trajectory, so let me just focus on that. Uh, that's why I said I, I support the CHIPS Act, I support the infrastructure bill, I support the um, cynically named Inflation Reduction Act, but at least it had some investments in, in certain kinds of energy technology where, where we are falling behind China. And, um, and I support the limitations on uh, sharing semiconductor manufacturing capability with China. What, what we just did in October with this new set of policies was extraordinarily tough. But I think correct. And you know, basically saying China, any, anybody who wants any access to American technology can't be sharing it with Chinese, can't even have American educated, you know, professionals in Chinese companies and uh, things like that. So we're really trying to clamp down on the way in which we allow that trajectory to go forward. And we should, for the reason you mentioned. However, I'm a little more optimistic than you are about the path, because for one thing, Chinese are now sort of down into the 4 to 5% GDP growth trajectory. A lot of it's hard to discern with COVID and everything else, but they're coming back to Earth a little bit. Second, their workforce has already peaked in size and it's diminishing. That's going to be a huge problem for them, and they destroyed half their environment uh, along the way towards the industrialization they've achieved. And, uh, and third, you know, they're partly caught in, they haven't yet proven they can really get out of the so-called middle-income trap. I mean, they're not Argentina or even Mexico. They've got a lot of R&D on high tech, but, but they've also got a lot of poor people and a long ways to go to really get above that ten to $15,000 per year per capita income that most countries tend to get stuck at uh, or at least run up against a wall for a while. I have a colleague at Brookings, appropriate, appropriately enough named David Dollar, who's an expert in the Chinese economy. He lived in China for 20 years, and he's now at Brookings. And he, um, he's done these, uh, combining the demographics with the growth rate trajectory, he actually thinks that there's a chance that China will, in fact, overtake us in GDP in the 2030s, and then we will take number one back in the 2050s. Because by that point, our population will keep growing at this nice 1% to 2% per year, our productivity growth will be 1% to 2% per year, and the Chinese will be falling off. And a lot of demographic trajectory trends have the Chinese peaking, not just in their workforce, and population now 1.4 billion, but coming down even below a billion by the end of the century. 
Because you know what happens? It's, we're starting to see this in China. The China have li- Chinese have lifted the one child, child policy, but the Chinese intellectuals and urban dwellers don't want to have more than one kid. Just like the Koreans and Japanese and other people living in these modern, dense, you know, uh, high-cost urban centers have figured out because it's, they just can't afford it. And now China's building a little bit of a safety net because they're advancing their capabilities, so you don't need 10 kids just to keep you alive and well when you're an old person anymore like they used to. So I'm not trying to... I still like... Even though you, you took me on rightly so, fairly enough, I still like your overall message because you are right. We got to keep reminding people we cannot let up in our effort to improve our own economic strength and at times limit the Chinese growth. I agree with you, but I'm just a little more optimistic that with some of the pieces we've got working together in our favor already and all the allies we have, that the long term future belongs to the Western democracies much more than to China, in my opinion, even in economic and industrial terms. But, you know, we'll see, and I agree with your concern. We better keep after it. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, could you please just share your thoughts about the increasing influence of China with the former uh, republics of the Soviet Union, such as in Central Asia, in Central Asia, as Russia weakening politically and economically Chinese influence in Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan is increasing. Could you please share your thoughts about that? Yeah, I don't have, those are good points. I don't have detailed, profound thoughts about the Central Asian republics and China's ambitions there. You know, that is part of the Belt and Road Zone. That's the area, half the world, most of the world is within the Belt and Road Zone. And, uh, and so they certainly have ambitions to have peaceful relationships with those countries, to exploit their mineral wealth, uh, to be their preferred economic partner, and then to use that economic relationship to their own advantage in, a, at times, a coercive way. I have no doubt that is sort of their vision. Good news is Putin probably has no doubt that's their vision. And so, you know, there are some natural constraints on this Russia-China rapprochement as long as we don't push them so far together ourselves that they have nowhere else to turn. So I sort of like the fact that the Chinese make Russia nervous when they get involved in this part of the world. And if I were a Kazakh, I would probably welcome the fact that now I have a choice in terms of who I'm going to ask for investment, which companies I'm going to invite in, who I'm going to partner with. So, and also, as Americans, even though I argued before, like Bob Kagan says, we're, we're not really a status quo power. You know, we really do want democracy to spread everywhere. I don't mean this to sound anti-Kazakh or anti kyrgyz but uh, I don't care that much what happens in Central Asia from a U.S. national security point of view. So even if the Chinese get a little more influence, I can live with that. Uh, so all, overall, yeah, it's an interesting place to watch. It doesn't cause me a lot of heartburn, and I think it probably causes Putin more heartburn than it causes me, which I like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Doctor. Would you please um, bring into the overview the challenges of the climate and how that could enhance cooperation and or competition? Yeah, uh, it really could do either. And, you know, concern about climate change. China um, has a lot of low-lying cities, so they're kindred spirits to Floridians, in that sense. Uh, they don't have necessarily the effects on rain patterns or drought uh, to the extent of much of the Middle East, North Africa does, where you're, or the American West, where you're already seeing drought patterns intensified by climate change. So in that sense, the Chinese may not care about drought that much, because they can be pretty cynical, but they do need food from Africa, Latin America, so they have to watch climate trends for that reason, and they have to watch, again, rising sea levels. So I think the Chinese probably do care quite a bit about climate, uh, but that doesn't mean we'll automatically be able to cooperate with them, uh, because both China and the United States have the burden of caring more about short-term economic growth than either one cares about climate. We're blunt. We're still using more hydrocarbons as a human species than we ever have before, even as we improve renewables. And so the trend lines aren't good. I went to my first conference ever in October on geoengineering, climate engineering. 
So I actually think we're going to have to do it someday. Um, and you could imagine the U.S. and China cooperating on that, but you could also imagine one of them reaching the conclusion we should put aerosols up into the high atmosphere before the other one does. And then having this issue be divisive, where one country thinks we have no choice but to do it, and the other country thinks that we're messing with Mother Nature and we should really, you know, mend our ways on energy use rather than throw another artificial substance on a massive scale into the atmosphere to, to counteract the other massive thing we've done to the atmosphere. So that could be a cause for competition or even conflict. So, I guess, in summary, I think it's an area we should cooperate. I don't think it's necessarily an area we will cooperate. And as the overall relationship gets more poisonous, I think the odds of us cooperating on climate go down. Sorry to be a downer on that one. Thank you once again for your excellent comments. Um, I'd like to say a perspective on Hong Kong, where China um, said 50 years of self-rule back in 97 uh, would happen. Uh, and obviously they eroded that commitment. And you see that as portending a, uh, a similar issue in Taiwan. Yeah, it's a great question. I have a few thoughts on Hong Kong, and I'm sure a lot of people in the room do as well. I've never had the good fortune to go. And people who have told me about it, and what I've learned about it, talk about just such a unique and amazing place. But why would the Chinese want to mess with that? So I'm critical of them for what they've done. Also on human rights and democracy grounds. On the other hand, I have to say, if I were Chinese, and I saw the Western world getting offended about how we handled Hong Kong, when it had basically been stolen from China by the Western world 200 years ago, and now we're sort of, you know, unfavorable towards how they reintegrated into their country after we stole it fair and square, I guess, or in Princeton. Um, if I were Chinese, I would be offended as hell by the hypocrisy of the West on this issue. That's not to defend what they've done, but I try to think about it in those terms, just to imagine how the Chinese would look at it. And the last thing they're going to do is take advice from any, you know, any Anglo-Saxon on how to manage Hong Kong. We feel like they have any obligation in broad historical terms to us on this issue. And they do think in broad historical terms. And they certainly remember the century of humiliation where the Western world made them be complicit or part of an opium trade that they didn't really want after they had sort of not indulged in the kind of imperialism that we of European stock did all over the world. And, uh, and they suffered the consequences and then suffered from Japan. And yes, Mao killed a lot of Chinese, but so did the Japanese and so did the Western world. So when I do this whole try to get in their head on, on Hong Kong, I can sort of see why they did what they did. However, coming back to your final point, it was stupid because it guarantees that Taiwan's not going to want to be part of China for a very long time to come, if ever. And certainly this whole generation of Chinese political leaders is going to have to pass from the scene and then probably their successors before Taiwan is ever going to have any interest in finding a one country, two systems model. Whereas otherwise, you probably could have found a clever way, maybe not the exact Hong Kong model, but something uh, echoing it. Uh, you probably could have, over time, hoped for a, a diplomatic agreement, some kind of a confederation where Taiwan still is largely autonomous, and maybe even has its own paramilitary, but you know, uh, otherwise becomes part of a broader commonwealth of China. I think that idea is gone, probably for all of our lifetimes and our kids' lifetimes and their kids' lifetimes, because the Taiwanese watched what happened in Hong Kong. So anyway, on the one hand, I used to work at the Congressional Budget Office, on the one hand, not the other. <laughs> but I come back to thinking, the Chinese just really made a big mistake. Not, not that they should have been listening to our high and mighty council about how to handle Hong Kong out of some 50-year treaty they negotiated with the people who had stolen it from them, but, but more out of enlightened self-interest. And they showed, in this case, they did not display very good enlightened self-interest, in my, in my opinion. Um, so you mentioned the Chinese Chinese 
know, strategies and policies and everything. I'm wondering, are there any discussions about agricultural policy? The Chinese have bought up already several of the largest um, yeah, the farms and, um, and companies, um, and it seems to be like no check on that at all in private farmland. Um, is this being discussed? Does anyone notice that? Or some it's a good point. I think that people talk about it, at least the people I hear discuss it. Um, and I don't claim to be an expert on this. We talk about it more in terms of what the Chinese are doing, let's say, in Latin America, within Brazil, you know, or other countries, not so much within the United States. I don't know the percentage of Chinese acquisitions of American farmland. If somebody does, please let us know. But I don't sense that this has become a big problem here yet. In fact, what they really want, they know that American agriculture is much better than theirs, and we have much better farmland. They really want to buy our, our, our food. And this is part of where you know, we've, we've had some leverage uh, in the trade talks, even if it hasn't gotten to a you know, good outcome yet. But no, I don't have the sense that the Chinese have gotten to the verge of overtaking American agriculture, but I do think what they're trying to do in other places, in Africa and in Latin America in particular, is definitely worth watching. But thank you for the question, because it'll make me focus on that more myself. And let's take a couple more questions here. Is one back there? Yes. Uh, Dr. Hanlon, if you were given an increase in military spending for the U.S. military budget, where would you spend it in Asia? Yeah, it's a good question. By the way, one of the things we're doing that's a good policy that I support, we have this thing called the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, which mirrors the European Deterrence Initiative. The European Deterrence Initiative was created after 2014 when Putin stole Crimea, and it's largely about improving our position in Poland, and now, of course, further east. The Pacific Deterrence Initiative is designed to improve base access in other smaller archipelagos, maybe to begin to repair or restore the U.S.-Philippines alliance, although we have to be careful about that as we watch Filipino politics. And uh, certainly the Philippines is a place where I would like to see us, over time, have more of a counter to China's assertiveness in the South China Sea, just based on geography. But I think it has to be done with some care so as we don't get overextended and then wind up having Filipino politics sort of pull the out from under us. I do subscribe, more or less, Bob Gates put it elegantly, but the Princess Bride movie put it more street, which is, I don't want to fight any more land wars in Asia. And so, uh, actually Gates said it pretty much like that too. But, uh, so I don't really want alliances with Vietnam or India. Even though we can have better partnerships with both those countries, I, I would not like to see Americans committed to go fight in their defense on their territory. So I don't want to go that far. It's more the archipelago nations that are of interest. And I expect that in some cases the Chinese will be successful in persuading countries to let them have access. But, you know, we're the ones that taught that if you want to be a superpower, you should have a lot of bases around the world. And the Chinese are so far behind us in that domain. And I think they probably will, in some cases, catch up a little. But we should engage in that competition. And we're far and away better at it than they are. So whether it's the tiny countries like Palau, whether, you know, whether it's you know, Papua New Guinea, whether it's Singapore, where we already have some presence, as you know, uh, but especially the Philippines, I would just like to see us to sort of turn up the rheostat with more closer military engagement, not necessarily alliances or big bases, as a function of what the Chinese do. You're basically sending them the message, if you get more assertive, we can also get more assertive. And try to introduce a certain kind of proportionality to how we proceed down that path. But overall, I like our position. We have amazing allies in the Asia Pacific, and the Chinese don't. So they got to do it on their own, and we've got the best allies the best alliance system in the world by far. Uh, let's take a couple more. It seems like there's a lot of interest in uh, Thanks okay. for a brilliant uh, presentation. I can see that how you uh, churn out 21 books. <laughs> um, so, as regards to Ukraine and how philosophy, as, as you present it to the future, what did we do wrong in Ukraine? And was there an element of naivete that is present now in all these boards that you're sitting on? 
Well, you certainly got above your next event with, uh, with, with Angela Stent and, and Ambassador Yovinovich. And uh, it's great you got them together. I think I'm coming back down and listen to that one myself. But uh, my own take on that, I, I wrote a book five years ago, a short book called Beyond NATO, A New Security Architecture for Eastern Europe, because I never thought the idea of bringing Ukraine and Georgia into NATO was a good idea. I don't, but I don't blame us for the war. There are some American academics and critics who, like John Mearsheimer in Chicago, who say, well, because we made that invitation in 2008, we didn't, we didn't act on it, we just made it hypothetical in the long term, that we sort of caused the problem. I don't think we caused the problem. What caused the problem is that Vladimir Putin is a violent, bitter, angry imperialist. However, we already knew that in 2008. <laughs> he just wasn't quite as bad yet. And we still wound up with this compromise, which I know many of you remember from the 2008 NATO Bucharest summit that's been now so widely written about in the last year as people try to go back and ask, what were the antecedents to this operation? And I do think this is an example in life of where compromise is worse than either extreme option, because what a lot of you may recall, George W. Bush and Condi Rice went into that summit. They wanted to offer Ukraine and Georgia a near-term NATO membership with a so-called membership action plan, which sets the clock ticking. You do a few specific technical things, and you're in within a few years. Angela Merkel, and uh, was it President Mitterrand at the time? I forget who was leader of France in 2008, but they said no. This is too far. It's going to piss off the Russians. Ukraine is so integral to their view of themselves. They even have the same founding city. Kiev is essentially the original city of both Russia and Ukraine, at least in Putin's mind, a lot of Russian nationalists. And this is just a, you know, we may think of NATO as a purely defensive pro-democracy alliance, but it's still the most powerful military organization on Earth and the one that they faced during the Cold War. So if we extend it to, or say we're going to extend it, to Ukraine and Georgia, it will just guarantee that the uber hard right nationalistic Putin like Russian politicians will use that issue internally to demonize NATO and then ultimately perhaps at Ukraine's expense. So the compromise was let's publicly say that someday we'll bring Ukraine and Georgia into NATO, but no timetable and no interim security guarantee. That was a bad idea. <laughs> And so I wrote this book a few years later saying, well, maybe we need to find a way that if Putin will uh, get his you know, support for the separatists in eastern Ukraine to end, and maybe we can create a new security organization where we, you know, sort of like the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, done correctly, where there's actual backbone behind this thing, and try to create a zone of neutrality, as with Austria, Switzerland, at that time Sweden and Finland, that would also include Ukraine and Georgia and try to make sure that Russia didn't feel like we were trying to snatch Ukraine and bring them into the West, although we would try to snatch Ukraine in every other way, economically, culturally, and let Ukrainians make their own decisions. That was my proposal. I still think I was right, but, uh, but I, don't blame, I don't blame Bush or Rice or Clinton or any of their successors for, um, for the actual fact that Putin decided to wage war mercilessly against a defenseless or largely defenseless civilian population out of some sense of old-fashioned historical grievance and you know desire to reconstruct the Russian Empire of all that's on him. At a moral level, that's on him. But I think we made a strategic misjudgment at the 2008 Bucharest summit. So we'll see what Angela and Masha say. Uh, next time. Naivete, you know, in your thinking for the future. Can you, can you identify the elements of our uh, defense intelligence that allowed us to be in a position uh, where we had to respond to uh, Russia through Ukraine in such a terrible way? You just, you, there was a disagreement, you know. I mean, I, I had this disagreement with a lot of proponents of NATO expansion. And they would say, you should expand because you're promoting democracy, you're consolidating a Europe that's whole and free. It's the better way. And someday Russia's going to realize there's no alternative. And they'll accommodate to it. And my view was, I agree with the ethics of everything you're saying. I just have a different calculation about Russia and their politics and how they will behave. 
And so if, if I was right, as I think I was, uh, mostly not because of any genius about Russia that I had in my head, because I listened to George Hennon, Mikhail Gorbachev, Bill Perry, Sam Nunn, people who I thought were really trying to get inside the Russian mind. Then you either need, to, if, if this view about Russia is correct, you either need to bring Ukraine into NATO immediately, so there's no time for Russia to attack before we would be committed to come to their defense, or not promise to do it at all and look for some other mechanism. You can have that debate. But if you think that Russian politics are going to go in a bad direction, as I think we already should have known in 2008, then the, the problem is you can still come to either position. And bureaucracies and alliances sometimes then just compromise on what seems like a middle ground. But in this case, the middle ground was worse than either extreme, I think. I think we can take one last question. Yeah, um, you can talk about something that I found very interesting. Um, primarily about uh, alliances. You know, if might is made um, through economic viability, and I think America is about 20% of the economy of the world, and if you add in the European Union and a few other places, you'd have a half or maybe 60% even of the world economy, and then you look at population mass for 4% of the population, and then you add all those alliances in again, you know, now all of a sudden we're about 25% of the world population. Um, I, I guess when I look at China or I look at Russia or I look at some other places, what I see is, is forced alliances. Whereas we have freedom alliances in some ways. They may not be perfect, but there's some freedom alliances. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, rather than the aggressive side of the feeling that we have to force some kind of issue, just the power in the alliances that we've made, especially in the last few years? Well, I yeah, I think you framed it very well. I would agree with your framing. But I think that, you know, in that sense, notwithstanding that we share some of the criticism of what happened before February 24th, I think the response of NATO to the Ukraine crisis has been very good. And we've made sure, first of all, there's no ambiguity, we will fight to defend ourselves. Secondly, we've helped Ukraine survive. And then we gradually figured out how to help them a little more and more and more and more while managing the escalation risk of the direct Russian retaliation. So in that sense, so far so good, except that of course, close to 100,000 people are dead and there's no end in sight for the war. So we're gonna need, this will probably be your most interesting part of the rich conversation you'll have with Masha and Angela, like what's a realistic end game? And the alliances, that's not your question specifically for me, I know, but. The, the alliance issue here has gotten us to a good sort of interim partial strategy, but it doesn't really give us a long-term vision for how to end this thing. And, and maybe alliances can't be expected to do that, but the, I guess what I'm trying to say is I agree with everything you said about alliances being great. They don't necessarily in and of themselves tell you how to solve a specific problem that appears at your doorstep. You still have to figure out how you're going to deal with it. And the only thing alliances backed up by these mutual defense treaties make automatic is that we'll all defend each other's territory as if it were our own. So therefore, it's pretty clear, you know, China better not attack Tokyo. But that's usually not the real issue. The real issue is whether the Chinese attack the Senkaku Islands where no Japanese live. Or what, do we, what about if the Russians attack a, a small Norwegian claims or a, a, a Swedish or Finnish island in the Baltic Sea, where maybe only 30 people live. Or, you know, something like that. And we decide how we have to calibrate the response. So I completely agree with you about the importance of alliances, but they are not, in and of themselves, a strategy. They are a tool. And they, they, they set the foundation for a successful grand strategy, but they don't answer all the hard questions. So they still put them all back in our court and do it better. Yeah. And if we didn't have those alliances. Absolutely. I'm a strong proponent of keeping them. Uh, even though I did not want to expand NATO the way we did, and I certainly didn't want to promise the membership to Ukraine and Georgia the way we did. And, and you've heard me say I don't really want to expand alliances to include Vietnam or India, other places where we might have to send American troops to fight on the Eurasian landmass, where geography works against us. So I think, you know, George Kennan said the places we should care most about back in 1945, it's changed a little but it would be Western Europe, including the British Isles, Japan, and North America. And I think at this point, it would include a lot of East Asia, but it's not like we have to dominate all of East Asia. We do want to protect the Koreans and 
you know, I think a few other key partners. And the Middle East has become much more important for oil, although that's shifting again. So you might want to add a couple more regions to Kennan's list. But I think, for the most part, he was correct to say we have to remember some regions matter a lot more to us than others. So I'm not interested in that much more alliance expansion, but I agree with you, the allies we got uh, are enormously consequential and beneficial to our position. That's why when I look out, and I guess this is a good question to finish on, because um, I'm going to sort of tie a bow around this. But when I, when I look out, in these alliances that you were just talking about, we've got, even if we don't include the sort of quasi-allies, just look at the East Asian, you know, Japan, Korea, Australia, and NATO, EU, Canada. It's a, plus us, it's a billion people. And our population's you add up all the different pieces, about stable, maybe slightly declined. The Chinese have 1.4 billion, but that is headed dramatically down. And yes, they pumped a lot of money into certain areas of R&D and industry, and we should be worried, and we should try to compete better than we have been, although we're doing better the last few years. But I don't see any reason why the long game should favor that. We've got more land, we've got, we've got a, you know, open, protection of the individual, which is crucial for scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got each other as trading partners as long as we don't develop vulnerabilities and mitigate the ones we already have today in uh, our dependence on China. So when I look long term and I think about alliances, I feel like the West should never decline compared to China. And so I guess maybe that would be just sort of a boost of some self-confidence as we face this uh, rising challenge. Thank you very much.